Welcome to The Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We pray that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a message from Pastor Luke Cobray. Tonight we're going to get into the Word. And, and if, you're, if you're just joining us or you weren't here last week, we, I, I started a series, a, a kind of a different series in, in, in looking at the history of some of the apostles or the pillars of the church. History is something that's so important to me. I, I'm one of those people that I enjoy history. I, I have the privilege of teaching church history in our Bible college. Any of my Bible college students in the house? All right. The ones that cheered are the ones that like history. The ones that didn't say anything, they were the ones like, man, I, that was a rough class, but it's all right. History can either be for you or against you. But I believe that we have a lot of lessons in the church to learn. You know, all throughout our society, people pay crazy amounts of money to spend time with somebody who has experience. You know, if you wanted to get into investing for your future and your stocks or whatever it might be, you know, you'd want to sit with the best. You'd even pay money if you could, if you could afford it, to sit with Warren Buffett and have Warren Buffett tell you what you should do with your finances and your stocks. People sit with business experts and they, they go to seminars and they, they talk to different people who are uh, experts in different fields and they try to lean and glean or glean from their experience. And I believe that the Bible is chock full of people who have lived lives, not perfect lives, praise God, because we look like the Bible says, and I just quoted out of, out of Hebrews, the 12th chapter, that we look to Jesus as the author and the finisher of our faith. But sometimes I'll tell you, I'll just be honest with you. Sometimes I get a little discouraged looking to Jesus because I just don't measure up. I just can't quite make it there. You know, I, I strive to be like him. I strive to, to act and speak and to, to think like Jesus. But it seems like I, I, there's always something in the road of the walk of my life that I, I trip and I fall on. But praise God that there's wonderful men and women in the Bible that are pillars, that are truly staples of the church, people that we look up to in our day and age, that they lived a real life. A life full of mistakes, a life that was, was full of imperfections, a life where they learned hard lessons. And I think that when we look at their lives, when we look at the stories of some of these men and some of these women in the Bible, and we look at what they went through, I believe that we have a lot to learn. The reason I like history so much is I believe that if we don't know our history, and if you've taken my church history class, you, you, you've heard this, that if we don't know our history, that we're doomed to repeat it. And if we don't understand where we came from or why we are or what happened in the past, then we're doomed to follow the same path. But I believe that if we can learn, that if we can glean from people in the Bible, if we can learn from the stories and the history of those who have gone before us, especially those who have walked with Jesus, I believe that we can really just grow exponentially in our walks with God. That we can be like what I said I want to be like in Jesus. I believe that we can grow each and every day more like Jesus because of the grace of God. So last week we looked at Peter. Probably my, my favorite uh, character or apostle in the Bible. Just because I can relate so much to Peter. And there's a couple other people in the course of the next couple of weeks that I want to look at. But tonight I want to take a look at, and the, the, the title of the series is it's called Looking At, and then we'll talk about the person's name. Looking At, tonight I want to talk about the Apostle John. Looking at the Apostle John. But before we look at John, I want to kind of tell you, lead you to where we're going. I'm going to just give you outright the whole lesson before we even look at John and then we'll conclude and see how we came about this lesson. I don't know if they have it on the overhead. I sent them a text message right before church, but if you've got your Bibles, go with me to the book of Matthew in the fifth chapter. This is Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is speaking to the general public, to you and I, to his church, recorded. In Matthew in the fifth chapter, Jesus says a statement that oftentimes you'll hear at church. Matthew in the 5th chapter, oh cool, they did get it. Matthew the 5th chapter, verse number 13. Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It's good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. This is where I want to think about for a moment. Verse number 14, Jesus says these words. He says, you're the light of the world. A city that is on a hill cannot be hidden. It's so neat to see snow on our mountains for the first time in like ever. And, uh, you know, I was telling my wife as we were driving home at, at night on Monday, it was really neat to see after the snowstorm, uh, there used to be a time when all the ski resorts would have their night sessions or their night skiing, and you could see the mountains were just aglow in the back, uh, behind the, you know, behind the back, the, the dark sky. And it was really neat to see on Monday, because of the snowstorm, all the ski resorts, all of their lights were on. You can see Wrightwood, and you can see in, in, in Running Springs, Snow Valley, and you can see uh, Snow Summit and Big Bear. And there was just these lights shining from the mountains, from behind the mountains, and the mountains were silhouetted. 
And a light upon a hill, perched up on the top of a hill like a lighthouse, it's just not easily hidden. Jesus says that's you and I, the church. That's the description of who we are, of our walk with God, is we're to be like that light upon a high place for the whole world to see the light is to shine the glory of God. He goes on and he says in verse number 15, he says, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a house, but a lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. In verse number 16, Jesus says, so let your light shine before men. So let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and not glorify you, but glorify your Father in heaven. Jesus gave us a mission to be a shining ember, a burning light, a beacon for the lost world to see what truth is through Jesus Christ. Not for us, but for the glory of God. Tonight I want to take a look at the Apostle John. Because when we think of John, we think of the Apostle of Love. I think of the, the famous paintings of the Lord's Supper. When you've got Peter on one and, and you've got Judas reaching into the bowl. And there's this image of John, tender-hearted. His facial expression is often soft and, and supple and sweet. And he's the one, the disciple, whom was leaning on the chest of Jesus. And so we get this image of John, the Apostle of Love the disciple of love. We get this image of John as somebody who was tender-hearted, who was full of mercy and full of compassion, who was, who was gentle to the touch and, and, and with his words. But as we look into the history and the story of John, we'll see that it's not always quite that case. And much like Peter, John was full of mistakes too. John was full of imperfections. But yet, as he walked and as he progressed with his walk with God through Jesus Christ, he became somebody, a light, a gospel of love. So today I want to look at the life of John. I want to look at some things in John's life. I want to look at some lessons that we can apply or we can see in the life of John. Now, John was, is known in the New Testament for writing five of the books of the New Testament. Beside from Paul, John wrote the most. John wrote the gospel of John, so they say. Also, the epistles are the letters of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, as well as the book of the Revelation. So John is a prolific, prolific author of the New Testament. And here we see in John's books a difference in what we would call the synoptic gospels. I'll use that word, the synoptic gospels. The synoptic gospels are just this, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They call them synoptic because they coincide with each other. They build off of each other. They, they confirm each other. What Matthew says, Mark says. Or what Luke says, Matthew says. And so they continue on and there's a lot of uh, consistency within there. But then there comes John, the fourth gospel. And John portrays Jesus in a different light than Matthew, Mark, and Luke. John has a different focus than Matthew, Mark, and Luke. John has a different characteristic than Matthew, Mark, and Luke. John, for example, is about the life that comes through Jesus, whereas the, the synoptic gospels are about the kingdom of God. I believe it's 36 times in the book of John he talks about life through Jesus, whereas in Matthew, Mark, and Luke combined, we see it 16 times. On the other hand of the spectrum, Matthew, Mark, and Luke talking about the kingdom of God, 121 times they mention the kingdom, whereas John only mentions it five times in his gospel. So it's very different. It's very uh, out of the ordinary considering the first three books of the New Testament. John is written with a more first-hand or eyewitness approach. He uses descriptions and certain events that, that lead us to believe that he was there, such as uh, things that don't change the story, but they only add to it, such as when the woman who anointed Jesus' feet, John uses the illustration or the example, and he says that it filled the room, the fragrance, as to say, I was there, I saw it. Although all the Gospels were written in the third person, telling the story about Jesus, John is the most relative to read, because it's the most uh, uh, has the most significance of the eyewitness account. And John was one of the Gospels, or one of the Apostles, excuse me, that followed Jesus. And I believe that there were some very important things for us to see out of John's life, and some good and some bad. But let's go back to the very beginning here. In Matthew, the fifth chapter, one ver oh, chapter over, we see John for the very first time. 
where Jesus called Peter and his brother Andrew, or Simon Peter and his brother Andrew, from the boat where they were attending their nets or fishing, we see in the same story that there were two other brothers that Jesus called. One by the name of James, who was one of the first Christian martyrs, and one by the name of John. The Bible tells us in Matthew, the fourth chapter, that they were there, two brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called them. And immediately they left the boat and their father, and they followed him. Well, last week we saw that Peter left everything. We saw that Peter was a homeowner. We saw that Peter was married. We saw that Peter was probably a person of, of, of pretty decent uh, uh, a class in his society. And yet he left everything to follow Jesus. And here again we see two brothers with their father, James and John, and they also left everything to follow Jesus. Their hearts were receptive. And I believe that their hearts were receptive because this man, John, sought after something in his life. John, I believe you can relate to him and I can relate to him because John sought after the truth. That's why you're here, because you want to know the truth. That's why you're here, because you want to know what the truth of God is. Not just what some man says, not just some clever doctrine. You want the truth, and you need the truth. I need the truth in my life. I don't want to live a life based on conjecture. I don't want to live a life based on somebody else's stories or fables. I want to live a life that is solid, that is grounded, that is firm, that is based on the rock, that is based on the word of God, that is based on the truth, so that I know when storms come my way, that I'll be like that house that Jesus says that was built on the rock. Like Peter, who upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The truth of the word of God. Amen. You want the truth. I want the truth, and we can all relate to John, if for anything, that John wanted the truth. Because John speaks of, in his writings, John, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd, which if you read 2nd and 3rd John, are like a page. In his writings, 46 times, John talks about the truth, about the spirit of truth, about truth of grace. He talks about Jesus' teachings. John does something that none of the other Gospels do. John says, uh, gives us what's called the concept of the misunderstood statement, in which Jesus said something, and it's misunderstood by somebody, so Jesus clarifies it. Why? So that we would know and understand the truth. John sought the truth. John gives us the statements like Jesus says in John the 8th chapter, that you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. We have got to. I don't want to beat the dead horse of church and, 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 and continue on and thinking the, the, the importance of us in, in, in the Christian circles to read our Bibles, to spend time in the Word of God. But John, his heart was open and receptive to leave everything he had behind, his father and his family included, to follow after Jesus because this was a man who wanted to know the truth. And if you want to know the truth, Listen, if I want to know the truth, we have got to set time aside to get into the truth. Because if we don't make time for the truth, we will not know the truth. And therefore, the truth will not make us free. Even though it's there, even though it's been written, if we don't take the time to get into the truth, to understand what is truth, then all it will ever be is a book on our tables or a book on our shelves. You can have 15 different study Bibles, and maybe I'm just preaching to myself. They don't do you any good if you don't read them. If you study them, or if you, if you just leave them there, what benefit do they have but other than to adorn yourself? Church, we're here for the truth. We're not here to play games. I'll just tell you the truth. If you are here to play games, it's really disappointing. It's no fun to be a Christian on one day of the week, and yourself, or something else, six other days, to turmoil life. It's not fun, it's not comfortable. But when you know the truth, like Jesus says, it makes you free. And if we can learn from John, we've got to be disciples of the truth of Jesus Christ. 
to be commended like the Bereans in the book of Acts for searching the scriptures daily to find what the truth is in our lives. So we learn from John that John sought the truth, so must we seek the truth. But you know, John's not full of perfection. The image of John, the loving, the tender, the sweet disciple, the one whom, as he refers to himself so lovingly as the disciple whom Jesus loved, we learn from John that he also had some issues. Praise God. Because like I said earlier, I try to be like Jesus, and it comes sometimes it's a little discouraging. Because I say things I should have said. I do things I shouldn't have done. I trip and I fall. And Jesus didn't have those problems. But praise God, he had 12 disciples that did. And I believe we can learn a lot from those. And John, one of the great disciples, the one whom Jesus loved, John, the one who was in Jesus' inner circle, John was one of only three of Jesus' disciples who saw Jesus transfigured on the mountain and had a conversation with Moses and Elijah who heard the voice of God that said, this is my son, listen to him. John was the first to the tomb of Jesus upon hearing of his resurrection. John was one of the only disciples present at Jesus' crucifixion. John was one of the three disciples that were there at the Garden of Gethsemane when Jesus went to pray on the night of his betrayal. John was the disciple in whom Jesus entrusted his own mother to. And then you know, there's nothing like the connection of a mom to her son. And Jesus, as he's dying on the cross, says, take care of my mom. That's my paraphrase. But even in spite of all of that, John had his vices. He had some issues that he had to work out. And I believe that we can relate to them. I believe that we can understand them. I believe that we can get a hold of them because we all, at some point, are probably guilty of them ourselves. So today I want to look at that. Some of John's vices, some of the problems that John had in his life. John was very critical of others. I can relate to John. The Bible tells us, as we talked about last week, Peter was often the mouthpiece of the disciples. The one that when somebody came, Peter was the one to talk. When it was time to preach, Peter jumped up beside him. But the Bible tells us that John was always there. John was probably more like me in that sense where I can relate to John in the sense that I don't say a lot, but most of the time when I do say something, I regret it. Man, a few words, but as my wife will tell you in a family fight or a, in a little duel her and I might have, which we don't do very often, but any good marriage fights, praise God. <laughs> She'll tell you that my words can be very hurtful, very precise, very critical. So I can relate to this man, John, who the Bible says didn't speak very much. He was kind of the supportive one. He was on the side of Peter. He was always there. But when John spoke... He was rebuked by Jesus. John was a critical person. The Bible gives us an account of John and his brother James. If you've got your Bibles, go with me to the book of Mark. I want to just show you some things about John. Oh, excuse me, I said book of Mark. It's in Mark as well, but go with me to the book of Luke. Luke in the ninth chapter. Tells us that John finally speaks up. John, the younger brother of James, probably quiet, but very analytical and very thoughtful, had a problem with being critical towards others. John, sa or in Luke, John says in Luke, John answered and said, Master, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we forbade them because he doesn't follow with us. John was saying, he said, well, what's the big deal with that, man? So what? He said, don't, don't be doing that. You're not one of our disciples. John was saying, listen, he doesn't roll with us. He's not part of our group. He, he's not part of the group. He's not part of the crew. He doesn't go from city to city. And so who does this guy think he is? That he can cast out demons in your name. I told him, stop. If you're going to do that, you've got to be a part of the group. You got to be a part of the family. You got to be a part of the elect. Jesus comes back in verse number 51. Jesus says,
Do not forbid him. Excuse me, verse number 50. For he who is not against us is with us. Oh, that's cool. Jesus just corrected his action. Isn't that good? Don't you like it when you just get a little correction? Not like Peter. Remember last week, Peter, get behind me, Satan? And he says, man, that was a little harsh. Sometimes it's like, okay, I got that. My wife, I, I tell my wife all the time, I'm like the most convicted man in the world. I'll tell her, I'll, I'll be doing something. I don't remember what it was. It was like I was sharpening chisels in my garage and I started crying. I was convicted. The Holy Spirit said, These are, there's, there's some things in your life you need to work on. I'm like, sharpening chisels corrected me. I like those little ones. But this isn't John's only encounter with being critical of others. A few verses later, they're walking on their way to Jerusalem. Jesus has his eyes set on Jerusalem and they go to pass through the, the town or the area, the, the region of Samaria. And as John passes through, they expect Jesus to be welcomed by the people. I mean, after all, I mean, Jesus spoke to the woman at the well. I mean, th th this, is, this is Jesus. He's coming back into town. It's part number two. And when the Samar Samaritans don't receive Jesus, look what John and his brother say. A couple of verses over in verse number 54. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, the Samaritans not receiving Jesus, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them like Elijah did? See, John had a problem. He saw himself above others. He was very critical, judgmental in a sense. So they don't receive Jesus, and John says, hey, I got your back. I'm part of the group. I'm part of the crew. How about this? How about I call down fire like Elijah to consume these people because they didn't receive you? And I'll tell you, sometimes in my own walk, I'll tell you, I get so zealous for God, I just think, God, why don't you slap that person around? God, why is it that I am struggling to get by every day? And that person has nothing to do with you, and they succeed over and over and over again. God, why is it that I try to show the love of God, Christ, and I try to, try to live a life that says God is so, so full inside of me that my life is so fulfilled, and yet it looks like every time I talk to that person, their life is better than mine. Smite them, oh God. I'm sure we've all been there at some point. John was lightly corrected by Jesus. Don't rebuke them. But now Jesus comes back and he says, verse, the next verse, but he turned and he rebuked them, John and his brother. Now it gets a little more serious. And he says, you don't know the manner of spirit that you are of. Do you know what that means? Can I paraphrase that for you? Can I give you in, 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 other, in other words that might more reflect what, what that might, what might be for you and I? Get behind me, Satan. <laughs> Jesus himself tells John and his brother, you don't know what spirit you are of. What spirit are they of? The devil. John was critical of others. Sometimes Christians, this is where I get serious. Sometimes Christians come off as being judgmental. <laughs> no, 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 I know. I know. Nobody in this church. <laughs> Sometimes Christians come off to the world as though we're better. Maybe it's because the Bible says that we're God's elect. Maybe it's because the Bible says that we're brought into the, the family of God. Maybe it's because the Bible tells us that we're grafted into the vine or because we're adopted as sons or because we're a holy nation or a royal priesthood that we begin to get this idea or this thought process on the inside of us that we have something that the world doesn't have and that makes us better. But Christians all too often reflect the love of Jesus in a dingy and a poor light. Because like John, we're critical. When somebody makes a mistake because of humanity, we like to point it out. We like to make a big deal about it. Jesus even corrects these people and he says, don't worry about the speck in your brother's eye because you have a plank 
in your own eye. We get off on the tangent. We go off to a side road and we think that because we have Jesus, because we have the grace, because we're in the family of God that gives us a right to tell the world that we are better than them, when the truth is, is Jesus told us in the book of Matthew that we are a light upon a hill. And when we take it upon ourselves to judge the world through criticism, through our actions, through our words, through our looks, what we're doing is we're taking the light that should shine so brightly on a hill and we're putting a basket over it and we're taking the love of God that should be given to the world around us and we are hiding it for those around us. God, forgive me and how many times in my own life I can't even count how many people have I given a poor example of the love of Jesus Christ because I was judgmental, because I was critical, because I thought something that I shouldn't have thought of them. I had a different opinion of that person. When the Bible tells us that God loves us, all of us, not just the children of God, all of us. And we've got to learn from the lessons of John that we don't get so wrapped up in our own lives. We don't get so wrapped up in the decay of our society. Listen, you can't go on the news and see that our society is falling apart. You can't go on social media without getting frustrated because somebody wants to rant and rave. I can't even go on Facebook anymore because there are so many Christians that I know that want to take time out of their day to tell the world how wrong that they are and how right the person's view is so as to make the world adopt their view. But where in the Bible does it give us the right to do that? Because if I'm not mistaken, Jesus tells us in Matthew 7, 1, that we should not judge unless we ourselves want to be judged. So where in the history of the church did we find the rabbit trail that made it okay for us to stand on a soapbox in our society and make it appear as though we are better than somebody else because they messed up, because they got pregnant, because they had a problem with drugs, because they went back to alcohol, because they don't know Jesus, because they're homosexual, or whatever it might be. Where do we get off thinking as Christians that that is okay? When the truth is, Jesus came not to condemn this world, but to save this world. Man, I tell you, the fire of God came up on me on Friday with our young adults. I got on it about this example. I just couldn't help it. I'm not saying that you're bad. Listen, I'm telling you first and foremost, this isn't a preacher on his soapbox. I'll tell you first and foremost that I am guilty of being critical. I am guilty of being judgmental. I am guilty of thinking that because I'm a Christian, I'm better than the world. But may God forgive me for making the mistake of thinking that it's about me. May God forgive us, his church, for taking the light that should shine so bright to this lost and dying world and tainting it with the views and expressions of our opinions in society. We've got to focus on what's important. God, and no longer us. John was critical. We can be critical too. But that doesn't mean that there's an end to the road. It doesn't mean that we fall from grace because we've made the mistake. Because as we see through the history, John is not always this way. But this young, ambitious man had plans for his life. To be on a platform, to be someone. And he began to realize through walking with Jesus that life wasn't so much about him as it was about his service. John had a problem with being critical towards others, but did you know that John also had a problem with self-pride? He liked himself. Once again, I find myself relating to this guy. <laughs> you know it. I know it. 
we're all a little guilty. I mean, think about it for a moment. They make cell phones now with cameras <laughs> facing us. They make computers with high definition cameras facing you. Oh no, Pastor Luke, that's for talking on the phone. Come on. You know it. I know it. At some point in our lives, we've all been guilty of a little self-indulgence. Looking at ourselves, saying, all right, God did okay. <laughs> Maybe it doesn't have anything to do with looks. Maybe you don't like the way you look. But you still love yourself. There's still that pride on the inside. Maybe it's because of your heritage, your family. Maybe it's because of your education. Maybe it's because of the school of life that you've experienced. Whatever it might be. Listen, let's not beat around the bush. We Americans, we love ourselves. John had a problem with his brother James. To the point, they even go to Jesus and ask Jesus a very unique and special request. If you've got your Bibles, go with me. Just, just, just so you can feel better about yourself, if anything, tonight. Go with me to the book of Mark in the 10th chapter. Mark chapter 10. John and his brother. The Bible tells us that Jesus gives them a nickname. Do you know what their nickname is, John and James? The Sons of Thunder. We Christians, we like to say, man, that's a cool nickname. That's because they so loudly proclaimed the gospel of Jesus that they were like thunder. Or it could be that they so loudly proclaimed their opinions and their views that they were like thunder. In Mark, the 10th chapter, they go to Jesus. Matthew, I'll give them, I'll give them the credit. They do this at the behest of their mother. Mark in the 10th chapter, verse number 35. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, come to him saying, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Whenever something is like that, you know, you know kind of like, if I rub my Bible enough, like, do I get my three wishes? Jesus, will you do whatever we ask? And Jesus says, what do you want me to do for you? Before I say yes. And they said to him, grant us that we may sit on your right hand and on the other on your left in your glory. Oh, but, but it's in his glory. Lord, we just want to sit in your glory. You know what they're saying? Jesus, can we sit at the head of the table? Everybody else has got their, sit, their, their spot on the side. But when it comes time for us, can, can we sit next to you? Can can, can you move Peter over one? And, and, and I don't know, move, move Thomas or, or James the lesser over so that my brother James the elder or the greater could? C could you do that for us? Think about that bold statement. Jesus says to them, you don't know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink and be baptized with the baptism, baptism that I am baptized with? Jesus is saying, are you ready to walk the walk? Are you ready to talk to talk? And they said, we're able. And Jesus says, if you will indeed drink the cup that I drink and the baptized, baptism that I have been baptized with, that you will be baptized, but to sit on my right and on my left is not mine to give you, but it is for those for whom it is prepared. Listen to this. And when the ten heard it, they began to be greatly displeased with James and John. Yeah? Think about that for a moment. Lord, would you make me better than the person next to me? That doesn't go off so well, does it? Thank God we have the examples of history to show us that we're not alone. That when we look to ourselves and we want to have a platform to stand on, whether it be this kind of a platform or whether it be the platform of our work or our success or our life. We say, Lord, would you make my platform a little higher than the person next to me? Praise God that we know that we're not alone in our own selfish desires. So the disciples became greatly displeased, yeah, with James and John. Verse number 42, I think these are some statements that really begin to do some work in John's heart. Jesus called him to himself and he said, you know 
that those who are considered rulers over the Gentiles lord over it, lord over, lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so with you. But whoever desires to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever desires to be first shall be the slave of all. For even the Son of Man, myself, Jesus says, did not come to be served, but to serve, to give his life a ransom for many. I think it was the statement that Jesus' words began to sink into the life of John. This young, zealous, ambitious man who had plans for his life to be somebody, to stand somewhere. Who had a problem looking at people with judgmental thoughts in his mind. Who had, a, who had an issue when he comes to Jesus and says, can I be elevated above everybody else? I believe these are the words that begin to sink into John's mind and into John's heart. That it's not so much about the platform that we live on our lives, but it's the service we give to others that defines us. And so John began to hear these words of Jesus. His heart was open and receptive to the truth. Something began to happen with John. John was changed by Jesus' example. John was changed by Jesus' example. All throughout the Bible, we see as Jesus is teaching his disciples that it's about servanthood, that it's about servanthood, that it's about giving. And finally, we see in John the 13th chapter, Jesus gives the ultimate example to his disciples of service when he disrobes himself from his garments and he puts himself into linens or bath clothes or, 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 or wash clothes and he washes the feet of the disciples, did you know that John is the only gospel that accounts for Jesus washing the disciples' feet? I believe because it was a turning point in John's life as he stood there thinking in his mind, what on earth is the Son of God doing? Washing my feet. What on earth is the Son of God doing? Washing my feet. And so John became, began to change to the example that Jesus laid out. In John, the 13th chapter, Jesus says to his disciples, I'll just put it up on the over, he says, and if then your Lord and teacher has washed your feet, then you also ought to wash one another's feet. Verse number 15, for I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Verse number 16. Most assuredly I say to you that a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. Jesus goes on and he tells them, What I have done, you do also. Likewise to one another. I believe this is the moment in which John's life began to change. Here is this young, ambitious man, a little bit of pride a little bit of conceit, a little bit of judgmentalism. But as he walks with Jesus and he sees the examples of Jesus, he allows Jesus to change. He becomes the one that we know as the apostle of love. This man who said, I'd call down fire to consume a village. This man who said, I won't let somebody cast out demons in your name because they're not a part of our clique. Now all of a sudden becomes not known as this hot and temperamental zealous young man, but now he becomes known as this man who writes the most famous scripture on earth. The scripture that is known by more people around the world than any other scripture in the Bible. Coming from this hot-headed, arrogant, judgmental, conceited young man through the example of Jesus Christ sat down at the end of his life and penned what you and I now know is John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever should believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Verse number 17. For God did not send his son into this world to condemn it, but that though the world through him might be saved. 
The very man that said, I'll call down fire from heaven because they did not receive you is the very man who wrote, God did not send Jesus Christ to condemn the world, but to redeem it. John shows us that we've got to live a life that's transformed through Christ. John gives us the illustration and the example of a transformed life. It's possible for you. It's possible for me. To not be who we were, but to be who the Bible says. God's desire. Jesus' desire for John was to go from this arrogant, hot-headed young man to the apostle of love. The only of the 12 disciples who is said to not have faced martyrdom in his life to teach the world the gospel of love so that we might know that we experience love because God first loved us. That there is no fear in love because perfect love casts out all fear. That we might know that we have an advocate through Jesus Christ so that when we make the mistakes of John, so that when we make the mistakes of Peter, we know Jesus Christ loves us. And that just as God's desire for John was to go from a life of darkness to light, to go from a life of death to life, to go from a life of sin to righteousness, to go from a life of, of being judgmental to a life of love, God's desire for you is to transform life, to be a new creation, that sin would no longer have dominion over you and I, that we would no longer be children of the darkness but now children of the light, that we would no longer walk as sin, but now in righteousness. That we would no longer hate our brother, but now we would love because Christ first loved us. God's desire for us, as we see exemplified through John, is, that, is a transformed life that shines the goodness of God so the world might see our Father in heaven. <laughs> Seek truth. Make it a point in your life to get the truth. But as you do, don't walk the way of arrogance because you know something. Because it's not about how good we are, how high we are. The greater we are in the kingdom of God, the more we serve the world around us. Seek after truth, but don't be conceited in it. If God can use John, church, I believe God could use you. I believe God could use you. I believe God can use you. If God could use a fiery, hot-headed, tempered young man, and he can change him and transform him through Jesus Christ, I believe God can transform you through Jesus Christ. It's not your job to fix the world. It's not your job to solve the problems of society. Because you know what? You can't. There's only one cure for this world. Jesus Christ. And Jesus says this in Matthew, the fifth chapter, that you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Shine your light so all might see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. If God can do it through John, praise God, there's hope for me. If God can do it through John, praise God, there's hope for you. Did you guys get something out of the word of the Lord tonight? Listen, I just want to take just a quick moment. I don't want to take much more of your time. I'm going to let you out on time tonight. There might be some of you in this place today where you're struggling in your walk with God. Maybe you're just not there. Maybe you've lived a life where you think that it's all about church attendance or because your parents told you that you were a Christian. Maybe you're living a walk or a life where you think that because it's about your, your, your thought process, well, if I'm a positive person, or maybe it's because I give to charitable organizations or I'm a good person, that that's, that's what makes me right with God. The Bible tells us that it's set for each man to die once and to face judgment. Oh, what? I thought God didn't come to condemn the world. He didn't. He came to give us Jesus Christ that those through him might be saved. The Bible is very clear. It gives us two examples or two not two examples, but two destinations of what happens to us when we die. 
You either go to heaven or you'll go to hell. There's no other option. There's no gray area in between. And so I want to ask you, what makes you so sure you're going to, going to get into heaven? If you were to leave and to die, is it because you think that you get there? Is it because you were raised in church? Is it because your parents told you that you were a Christian? Is it because you give to charitable organizations like the Red Cross or you give a little bit of your tax return to, to help human aids or, or uh, efforts or whatever might be in Africa? Is it those reasons that you think that you're going to get to heaven? I remember one, told, one person told me that because they're not a, a Buddhist or a Hindu or a Muslim, that, that they thought that that just meant that they were going to get into heaven. But did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that you can't get to heaven because of a default? Did you know that the Bible tells us that you can't get to heaven because you think so or because you hope so? The Bible says you can't get to heaven because your parents told you you were a Christian or because you've given yourself the title. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that you because you attend church, because you serve in the children's ministry, or because you sing in the choir that you're going to get into heaven. And nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you're a good person means that you're going to get to heaven. The Bible tells us that we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, which means every person on the face of the earth does not meet the expectations of the requirements for heaven, and that is perfection. So how do we get there? We can't get there your way. We can't get there my way. We can't even get there some well-meaning church committee's way. The only way you and I can find ourselves with God in heaven is through Jesus. Jesus says he's the way, the truth, and the life, and no one goes to the Father except through him. So today I want to give you the opportunity to accept. The Bible tells us that it's the gift of God. It's eternal salvation through Jesus Christ. We're saved not by our works, not by our deeds, not by our actions, not by our church attendance. We're saved by grace through faith. So today I want to give you the opportunity to accept Jesus Christ into your heart. You see, like any gift, when you get a gift on Christmas, you have a choice whether you're going to accept it or return it or take it back. And just like that gift, God has given you the free will choice to choose whether or not you will accept or reject Jesus Christ in your life. And you say, how would I reject Jesus? Well, the only way we can get to God's heaven is God's way, and Jesus gives us this gives us that way in the book of John. Well, I was there, John 3.16, the same conversation as John 3.16. Jesus talks to a man by the name of Nicodemus, and he says these words, you must be born again. Now, that's not what you think of, or what Hollywood or society has made it out to be born again. From the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible has always meant the same thing, in the heart and the eyes of God. It means that you've given God all of your heart, you've given God all of your life. It's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ and with God. Let me prove it to you. The Bible in the book of Revelation, John wrote that too. Jesus is speaking to the church himself and he says he's coming back and when he comes back, he better find us, the church, hot or he better find us cold because if he finds us lukewarm, he says, I'll vomit you from my mouth. What does that mean to be lukewarm? He says, if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. That's shocking. And what Jesus Christ is saying is that lukewarm Christians are not real Christians at all. They're going to be rejected and ejected from the kingdom of God. What does it mean to be lukewarm? Lukewarm simply means that you've got your ups and your downs and your ins and your outs. You're not wholehearted for God. You're not wholehearted against God. Maybe like I talked about today when I was talking about seeking the truth, if you're just playing games. Listen, I love you enough. I respect you enough. I honor you enough to tell you the truth that you're not going to make it to heaven. You can't make it on your own devices. You can never be good enough. You can never work hard enough. You can never attend church enough to get to heaven. Because we've already been separated by God through sin. But Jesus Christ is that answer. Because the Bible says that for God so loved the world like we saw. That he gave his only begotten son. So today I want to offer to you the gift of eternal salvation. An eternity with God in heaven. And not just what happens when you die. Fire insurance. But starting right now with life. Because Jesus said these words. I have come to give you life. That you might have it more abundantly. I've come to offer you today the gift of Jesus, and it's your decision whether you want to accept or to reject this gift. Today, in a moment, I'm going to do something. I'm going to go like this. I'll go one, two, on the count of three, I'll go three. If that's you, I'm just going to ask you to do something real bold. I'm going to ask you to pop your hand up. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, I want to give my heart. I want to give my life to Jesus. You see, Jesus said these words. He said that if you confess him before men, he will confess you before his father. But if you deny him before men, he will deny you before his father. The decision's yours. Listen, God's not in heaven with a two-by-four waiting to whack you over the head because he'd done some stupid things. We've seen that with his disciples. 
God's not like a kid on an anthill with a magnifying glass trying to burn you up so that you'd learn your lesson. God loved you, he loved me so much that he gave Jesus Christ his most valuable possession to die on a cross naked for the world to see, to bear our sin and our shame. And in return, he wants all of our hearts. He wants all of our lives. And it starts by making that decision today. You say, man, I'm going to be embarrassed if I do that. Listen, I'm not going to embarrass you. But even if you were, wouldn't it be better to spend a moment of embarrassment than an eternity in hell? The decision is yours. Who should raise your hands if you've never given Jesus your heart, you've never given him your life? If that's you in just a moment, get ready. Pop your hand up. Who should raise your hands if you're not sure? If that's you in a moment, get ready. Pop your hand up too. I'll see it. Maybe you've been living lukewarm. Maybe you've been doing your own thing instead of God's thing. If you've been running from God instead of to God, hey, today make this the day you ensure your place with God in heaven forever and ever and ever, leaving hell behind, and you get hot in your relationship with God, accepting that gift and allowing the example of Jesus Christ in your life to transform you into who God wants you to be. It starts by making that decision. Stop living a life of emptiness. Stop living a life void of fulfillment. Jesus Christ has come to fulfill your life, and it starts by accepting him into your life. So from the front row to the back row, wherever you're at in the family rooms, I'll see you through the windows. Even if you're at home watching on the live stream and you say, man, that guy's talking to me right now. If that's you, get ready. This is your moment. This is your time. Don't let anybody distract you or deter you. Don't let a moment of embarrassment that might happen because, you, because of your thoughts stop you from making the very best decision you can make as a human being by accepting life through Jesus. Today, make that decision. From the front row to the back row, wherever you're at, this is your moment. This is your time. Don't wait another moment now is the time of your salvation. I'm going to count to three. And if that's you, get ready. Get your hand up. I'm a man. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it. Put it right back down. And we'll follow through together right afterwards. It starts by making that decision. If that's you, get ready. I'm going to count to three. You ready? One, two, three. Let me see your hands in this place today. All right, I see you, my friend. One, two. I see you right over there. Two wise people. Anybody else? Uh, ushers pointing over there. Three wise people. Anybody else? Four. All right, I got you right there. Four wise people. Anybody else in this place? You say, man, I wonder if I should. Yes, you should. This is your moment. This is your time. Anybody else? Hey, I didn't embarrass them. I won't embarrass you. Anybody else? You say, man, I wonder if this, if I should. I should. You should. Now is your moment. Now is your time. Anybody tonight? Well, praise God for four wise, wonderful people. I can feel it in my heart that there's more of you in here. And you're saying to yourself right now, I just haven't landed. I just haven't concluded. I haven't answered that yet. And so I want to encourage you. You don't get saved by raising your hand. In a moment, we're going to pray together. If that's you, when I instruct the people that raise your hands, I want you to follow through. Come on, make that decision today. If that's you, and you say, man, I know it was me and I missed it. It's okay. It's not too late. Here's what we're going to do. We're all going to stand right now. As we do, if you raise your hand or you should have raised your hand, I want you to grab your coat, your sweater, your purse, your Bible, a friend of you, a friend. I want you to get out of your seat, get out of your chair. Come meet me right here. I want to shake your hand and I want to change destinies with you right here, right now. So if that's you today, come on. You can come. Get out of your seat, get out of your chair. Make that decision today. How deep how great If that's you, come on. Wherever you're at. All right. Praise God. Hey, you guys came. I want to share something with you. You don't have to hang your head low. You know why? You're not going to a funeral. You're going to a birthday celebration. You're going to get born again. It's the first day of the rest of your life. That's really cool. Good job. You've got to be congratulated and celebrated for that. Here's what I want to do. I want to introduce a friend of mine to you. See this guy right over here? His name is Pastor Joel. Pastor Joel's a really cool guy. Nothing weird goes on, I promise, okay? It's not like that. He's going to take you guys right over there. He's going to lead you in prayer. You don't get saved by raising your hand. You get saved by asking Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. What does that mean, Lord and Savior? The leader of your life. Secondly, he's going to give you some free information. Real easy reading as you walk out of here. Say, what do I do? We're going to point you in the right direction. The last thing he's going to do for you tonight, he's going to invite you to come back. We want you to come back, hang out with us. We want to connect you with a friend here at church. We'll get you connected. They'll buy you a cup of coffee, sit down with you, get you a soda or something like that right before church. And they'll teach you some things about the Word of God for a couple of weeks. It's not this big, long commitment or program that you're joining. Just come back and get connected with a friend so that you get strong in the ways of God. You don't go back to the life that you're walking away from. So if you just turn to your left, my right, go right over there with Pastor Joel. Praise God. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. 
Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. If this message spoke to you, please share it with us. We'd love to hear from you. You can find more information at www.rockchurch.com.